Hello YouTube! In the previous video we saw a number of problems and as something of an important historical note which also sets the scene for Russell's solution to those problems I thought we could consider two earlier solutions. These are the solutions by Gottlob Frege and Alexius Meinong. So let's remind ourselves of the problems. Well firstly there was the puzzle about identity um, how do we account for the difference between the statements Bob Dylan is Bob Dylan and Bob Dylan is Robert Zimmerman if both Bob Dylan and Robert Zimmerman refer to the same thing? Uh, then there was the problem of substitutivity. So how do we account for the fact that one of these statements is true and the other is false? Again, given that the name Bob Dylan and the name Robert Zimmerman refer to the same thing. Then we had puzzle about empty terms. So the present king of France is bald. Well, there is no present king of France. So is this is this proposition true or false? Then we had negative existentials. The present king of France does not exist. This seems to be true, but if the present king of France uh, denotes something, then that thing must in some sense exist, making our statement false. On the other hand, if it doesn't denote anything, the statement should be simply meaningless. So there, there we have our four problems. Firstly then, Frege. Frege is uh, an enormously important figure in philosophy and logic. Um, to analytic philosophy at least, he's arguably just as important as Russell. Of course he's not nearly as famous, um, but I kind of think that Frege is how we distinguish between people who are kind of into philosophy from people who are serious about philosophy. People who are serious about philosophy know Frege. Uh, so if this video is uh, indeed an introduction for you, then um, you're entering the big league now. Uh, well, I'm going to be quite brief here, I think. Frege had a general philosophy of language, but the important part for us is his distinction between sense and reference. Right, so the basic idea here is that for every, every expression has a reference and every expression has a sense. Now, the reference is the object that an expression refers to and the sense is the mode of presentation of the referent. Now, uh, we'll take each of these in turn. Reference, reference is quite simple, I think. Um, certainly for singular terms, it's quite simple. So, consider a person's name, Bob Dylan. These work in the usual way. We have the name Bob Dylan. Now, the referent of this name is the man, Bob Dylan. Simple stuff. Bob Dylan, the man, is the referent of Bob Dylan. Uh, similarly, the referent of Robert Zimmerman is the same man. Uh, or consider a definite description, such as the closest star to the Earth. The referent of this is the sun. Uh, and, of course, you could also call that the sun. The closest star to the Earth and the Sun have the same referent. Um, this, I think, is fairly simple stuff, uh, nothing too difficult here. Now, whole sentences are somewhat different. Uh, Frege believed that sentences refer to truth values, and there are two truth values, true and false. True sentences refer to truth, false sentences refer to falsity. So, the sky is blue refers to truth, the moon is made of cheese refers to falsity. In fact, um, Frege took both truth and falsity to be objects, which he called the true and the false. So, more precisely, we would say that the sky is blue refers to an object, the true, and the moon is made of cheese refers to the object, the false. Right? I hope that's clear. Of course, it is odd to think of truth values as objects. It's also a bit odd to think that every true and every false sentence refers to the same thing. Um, you know, for any for any whole sentence, there are only two things it can refer to, and that is it is a bit odd to think of it things that way. But um, this this latter oddness is relieved somewhat by the notion of sense. Uh, so I've said that sense is the mode of presentation of the referent. Uh, it's it's essentially a way of thinking about the referent, or more precisely, the sense is some condition an object has to satisfy in order to count as the referent. So, for example, 
the sense of Bob Dylan might be uh, the person born on the 24th of May 1941 who works as a musician who composed the 1983 album Infidels and, and so on, however much detail you want to put in there. In fact, we actually have enough detail there uh, already to, to, to specify the referent as being the man Bob Dylan. Uh, so the object that, that satisfies this sense here, the object that satisfies this sense, is the man Bob Dylan. So if an, ab if an object satisfies this condition, it is the referent of the name Bob Dylan. Uh, it, it so happens, of course, that an object does satisfy this, namely Bob Dylan himself. Uh, so the sense, then, determines the referent. The sense determines what the name Bob Dylan refers to. Um, we might also think of senses as being kind of like thoughts, our way of, our way of thinking about the referent. Frege himself had a technical account of thoughts, which I won't go into here, uh, but um, that's, that's one way of thinking about sense. Words and sentences are said to express their senses. So Bob Dylan refers to Bob Dylan, but it expresses the sense Bob Dylan. It expresses the way Bob Dylan is presented to us. Uh, and Bob Dylan is a musician that refers to the true, but it expresses the sense that Bob Dylan is a musician. This is what I mean when I say you can sort of think of senses as being thoughts. Bob Dylan is a musician. That sentence expresses our thought that Bob Dylan is a musician. Now, the important thing here is that reference is what determines truth value, but meaning is determined by sense. So the solution to some of our problems should now be reasonably clear. Let's take identity. Bob Dylan is Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan is Robert Zimmerman. Well, for Frege, if we're dealing with the truth of these propositions, they're equivalent. They, they each have the same referent. Each sentence has the same referent, and of course the names in both of these sentences have the same referent too. Um, but these names have senses as well as reference, and it should be clear that the, that the sense of each name can differ, so the sense of each sentence can differ. Uh, so, this arguably then explains the difference between these two propositions. The cognitive value of each proposition is different. Uh, the way that each of these propositions is presented to us is different. Robert Zimmerman is a different way of presenting the same referent that Bob Dylan presents. The problem of substitutivity is rather more difficult because in this case, not just the cognitive value, but also the truth value changes. Frege has a solution, though. He suggests that when we're dealing with constructions such as thinks that, believes that, fears that, hopes that, desires that, and so on, these constructions are called propositional attitudes. Um, when we're dealing with these, what determines the truth value uh, of the expressions are the senses rather than their reference. Um, so, Inside these constructions, expressions refer not to their usual reference, but to their own senses. So in this case then, Bob Dylan refers not to the man Bob Dylan, but to its own sense. And obviously the sense of Bob Dylan is not the same as the sense of Robert Zimmerman. So our terms are not co-referential, and therefore it's no surprise that the propositions have different truth values. In this case, uh, we have Frank, think that Frank thinks that Bob Dylan is a musician in this case. Well, that refers to the sense of Bob Dylan. And Frank thinks that Robert Zimmerman is a famous musician. Robert Zimmerman refers to the sense of Robert Zimmerman. It might at first seem rather arbitrary to say that the reference of expressions suddenly change in these contexts. But to be fair, we are dealing with the mental, with beliefs and thoughts and so on. If there's any context where an expression would refer to its own sense, where its reference would change, it's here, in this kind of unusual context. Uh, note that in most other cases, this kind of substitution doesn't cause any problems. So, Bob Dylan is a man, Robert Zimmerman is a man, Bob Dylan is a musician, Robert Zimmerman is a musician, and so on. Um, it's only in very particular kinds of context, known as opaque contexts, which I'm not going to explain here, that this substitutivity is a problem. And when we're talking about people's beliefs, fears, hopes, thoughts, and so on, 
The suggestion that the referent of an expression changes is quite reasonable, I think. Um, when I talk about Frank's beliefs, when I say Frank thinks that Bob Dylan is a famous musician, I'm using the name Bob Dylan to specify the content of Frank's thoughts. I'm not talking uh, about Bob Dylan himself, or at least I'm only indirectly talking about Bob Dylan himself. So it's no surprise that the, the referent changes. Um, so that's a plausible solution, I would say. Well, how about empty terms? The present king of France is bald. Well, the present king of France doesn't refer to a real thing, so it has no referent. And remember, reference is what determines truth value. So if the name has no referent, then the sentence as a whole has no referent. That is, it, it has no truth value. The sentence is neither true nor false. This is uh, an obvious consequence of Frege's view. Since there is no object referred to by the present king of France, there's no fact of the matter whether it's bald or not. Um, but, of course, the present king of France does have a sense. It specifies a condition an object would have to satisfy in order to be the referent. Uh, namely, the object would have to be presently king of France. So, equally, the sentence has a sense. It expresses a thought, and this explains how our sentence, the present king of France is bald, can be meaningful. Um, I just note that we, we kind of have to be careful here, given Frege's definition of sense as the mode of presentation of the referent. How can there be a mode of presentation of the referent if there is no referent? Um, well, there is not, of course, a referent of the present king of France, um, but sense, again, there, there is some condition an object would have to satisfy in order to count of the, as the referent. And we talk about different modes of presentation because there are many different ways of specifying such a condition. Uh, all that's going on in the case of empty terms is that no object satisfies the condition. Uh, well, in the first video, uh, you might recall, we did suggest that this proposition might be interpreted as a truth value gap. And we also saw that this solution would be unacceptable to Russell. So um, let's just take a quick look at Russell's criticisms of Frege's view. Russell had two basic objections to Frege. Firstly, he was a staunch believer in the law of excluded middle. Uh, this states that for any meaningful declarative sentence, uh, either the sentence is true or the sentence is false. There are no truth value gaps. So for Russell, if the present king of France is bald, has no truth value, then it can't be meaningful. Uh, but clearly it is meaningful. So it must have a truth value. Frege's solution can't be right. Uh, simple criticism there uh, based on the law of excluded middle. Russell's second objection is that there are difficulties in the notion of sense. Um, he has two points here. The first is that uh, there are obscurities and, and maybe inconsistency in the very idea of sense. Now, I'm not going to discuss this this point because the argument he gives for it is extremely difficult and there's a lot of discussion about whether he misinterpreted Frege, about whether the argument works and so on. As a matter of fact, uh, nobody really seems to know exactly what Russell is trying to say with with this first point, with the point about the incoherency of the idea of sense. Um, so there's not, not, I'm not going to deal with that. But um, the second point about sense is simple enough. He claims that sense is superfluous. We simply don't need it. Russell thinks he has a better theory. His theory can solve all the problems Frege's did, and more, uh, without recourse to the notion of sense. Um, so his point is, his own theory is better and more comprehensive, and it renders sense irrelevant. Now, we're not going to explore that in too much detail here because we're going to come to Russell's own theory in the next video. So we can, um, we can leave that to, to the side for now. These were his two basic criticisms of Frege. Well, that was Frege. Now, we turn to Meinong, Alexius Meinong. Uh, Meinong's solution applies to the final two problems we saw about empty terms. Right. Well, um, Meinong is able to maintain the commonsensical view that subject-predicate expressions work by 
referring to an object, then predicating a property of it. Uh, indeed, expressions must refer in order to be meaningful, uh, in, in his view. The solution, to put it briefly, is that some objects do not exist. The Doctor is an object. He is a Time Lord. He travels through time and space in a police box. His physical and psychological characteristics change radically and so on. Uh, but he doesn't exist. Now, this view is almost universally rejected in philosophy. It's often received not just criticism, but outright abuse. Uh, when you phrase it like I have, it can be tempting to say, well, so what? Of course some objects don't exist. Of course the Doctor is a time traveller and the Doctor doesn't exist. What's the big deal? The problem, of course, is how how something can have properties if it doesn't exist. How can the Doctor be a time traveller if he doesn't exist? Um, so, let's look at Meinong's ontology more closely, and then we'll see how it applies to the problems. It was a fairly unusual ontology. Uh, basically, Meinong holds that for, for any object, there are three ways it can be. There are three ways it, it might be classified. So the first, and most familiar, is existence. Existence applies to all the things that we're familiar with. Tables, chairs, rivers, people's dreams, cars, and so on. All of the things that we usually take to exist. Um, of course, there can be room for debate about that. Um, but basically, some objects exist. That's, that's reasonable, and that's something no one would disagree with. There are objects that exist. The second classification is subsistence. Now, these are objects that don't exist, but do have being. Um, now, being, what's meant here? Well, subsistence is a, a, a non-temporal, non-spatial form of being. Abstract objects, such as numbers, subsist. Uh, but they don't they don't exist, but they they do have some sort of being. Now I must confess I I have a um, I, I'm confused about how this is supposed to work. Uh, I don't know what that distinction means, so I'm not actually able to explain it in in any real detail because I don't understand it myself. I've I've never really been able to figure this one out. Uh, I don't get the distinction between being and existence. Uh, now, tables have existence, and they also have being. Numbers only have being. Uh, I'm not sure about that, um, but that's that's what my Nong's view is. There are objects that don't exist, but do have being. So abstract objects have being. Um, I see. I would say that you know um, wh why wouldn't you say, for example, that. Uh, abstract objects have a non-temporal, non-spatial form of existence. I don't really, I don't really understand the distinction there. Now the third, the third one though, there's a third category, and that's absistence. And objects which only absist have no being at all. Uh, so this includes merely possible objects such as the golden mountain, and impossible objects such as the round square. These objects only absist. Uh, nevertheless, they they do have properties. The golden mountain is golden, the round square is round. Um, absistence, uh, it is said, has no negation. Everything absists. Some of the things that absist also subsist, and some of the things that subsist also exist. So that's the basic framework of Meinong's ontology there. Um, you have objects which have being. So Meinong says that those objects subsist, and then some of those objects that subsist exist. Then you also have objects which have no kind of being at all. Um, right. Manong distinguishes uh, what he calls socene and scene. I don't know if I'm pronouncing those words correctly. Uh, socene essentially means the properties of an object. Uh, so one of the properties of my hair is that it's brown. Brownness then is part of the so scene of my hair. Seen just means being. If an object exists or subsists, it has seen, it has being. My hair then has seen. Uh, there are two important principles in my Nong's ontology. There's the principle of independence of so seen from seen, 
which is that the, the properties of an object are independent of its being or its existence. Uh, so an object, an object can have properties even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't exist, even if it doesn't have any kind of being. And there's the characterization principle, and that's that an object has the properties it is characterized as having. So take, for example, the round square. The round square is both round and square, uh, but it doesn't, indeed it cannot have being, cannot have seen. Um, so those are, I think, reasonably simple uh, principles there, and they're fundamental to Meinong's ontology. Now, the more technical details of, uh, of Meinong's views need not concern us. The point is just that Meinong takes existence, or he takes being, to be a property. So, just as an object can have or fail to have the property of redness, so it can have or fail to have the property of existence. Um, actually, this is something of a simplification of Meinong's view, but for our purposes here, it will do. Now, it should be clear how Meinong's view can solve some of our problems. Uh, to put it simply, empty terms do not pose a problem because there are no empty terms. So, uh, let's take the present king of France is bald. Well, this is true or false depending on which present king of France we have in mind, since there are uh, a plurality of objects corresponding to the present king of France. Some of them are bald, some of them are not bald. It depends on how we characterise them. Uh, the present king of France in itself is an incomplete object. It's indeterminate whether or not it's bald. Uh, how about the present king of France does not exist? Well, since Meinong rejects the assumption that if we're able to refer to something, that thing must exist, the solution is again pretty simple. The present king of France refers to an object, and that object does not exist. Uh, we, are, we are taking an object, namely the present king of France, and we're predicating a property of it, non-existence. Or we might say, since the present king of France is an incomplete object, we might say that we're taking a set of objects, namely the present kings of France, and then predicating a property of them, the property of non-existence. So, in a way then, Meinong's solution to these problems involving empty terms uh, is, is quite simple. He, uh, he's found a way of maintaining, as I said, the common sense way of thinking about them. Um, so, Russell's criticisms of Meinong. Well, firstly, Meinong's theory violates the law of non-contradiction, and as with the law of the excluded middle, Russell was a staunch believer in the law of non-contradiction. So take the round square. Well, since to be square is to be not round, the round square is both round and not round. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can specify a contradiction directly by simply specifying the object that is both round and not round. So, uh, for Russell then, this violates the law of non-contradiction, and that's just unacceptable. Um, secondly, there's a, a special case of this same problem concerning the predication of existence. So we've seen from the characterization principle that any object has those properties it's characterized as having. And existence is a property, so what do we say about the existent round square? The existent round square is round, it's square, and it's also apparently existent, since that's how it's characterised. So that might be a problem. We don't want to have to say that there is an existent round square. Well, finally, there's the problem that Meinong's ontology is just unacceptable. There's this huge quantity of non-existent objects, which in philosophy have uh, come to be known as Meinong's jungle. Um, Russell says that to claim that golden mountains or round squares have some sort of being involves a failure of that feeling for reality which ought to be preserved even in the most abstract studies. Um, note, however, that here Russell completely misinterprets Meinong. Uh, Meinong doesn't claim that golden mountains or round squares have being. They only absist, so they have no being of any kind at all. Um, only things that subsist and exist have being. 
and uh, things that exist include all the usual things and the things that subsist are slightly more unusual but not things that most people would have problems with. Most people don't have problems with uh, with numbers and so on but uh, certainly round squares and golden mountains in Minong's view um, they don't have any kind of being whatsoever so this is a misinterpretation. Uh, one of the reasons for this might be that in his earlier work Russell accepted something quite close to Meinongianism. Russell's earlier view before he developed his theory of descriptions was that everything has some kind of being. Uh, in Meinong's terms we would say that, that Russell's view was that some things exist and everything else subsists. Uh, so this third criticism, this idea that uh, of the unacceptable ontology, uh, it's, it's more of a criticism of his own earlier theory than of Meinong's theory. Um, the, the general consensus these days is that Russell conflated his own earlier position with Meinongianism. So uh, that, that, was, that was Meinong. Um, I myself must confess some sympathy for Meinongianism, but I do agree that uh, the ontology is somewhat inflated, though for a somewhat different reason. The problem I have with it, as I mentioned, is, is the distinction between existence and being. I've never been able to figure out how that's supposed to work. It seems to me far more parsimonious and sensible to say that some objects do exist and some objects don't exist. Uh, and that's all. So in Monong's terms, all objects absist and some objects that absist also exist. Introducing this notion of subsistence, I don't know what that is. But... Um, most criticisms of Meinonganism focus on the non-existent objects themselves rather than on the distinction between subsistence and existence. So, uh, you know, it's, um, it's not a popular view in, in philosophy, but it's worth being aware of it. Um, anyway, this, this really is a tangent we don't need to explore. Uh, we've seen Frege, we've seen Meinong, we've seen their solutions to the four problems, uh, and we've seen Russell's criti criticisms of them. In the next video, we'll examine Russell's solution to our four problems. Uh, and that's what this whole series really is about. So, uh, so yes, that's, that's next time. Thanks very much for watching. Goodbye.